so uh, here we go. This is the last of our, um, I think it's the climactic one of our 10 books of the year, isn't it, Mark? This is the last one, which is... Dylan it is, Jones, it's terrific. Dylan Jones' Sweet Dreams, the story of the new romantics. As you can see, big fat thing. Don't drop it on your toe. Um, the story of the new romantics slightly undersells the breadth of this thing, doesn't it? <laughs> Completely. Because, I, I mean, I always thought of New Romantics as being 1980, 1982, um, you know, and it was just that brief thing that was massively derided by the music press because it didn't fit into that kind of post-punk aesthetic, wasn't it? It was Jodpers and Pixie Boots. How can we possibly take this seriously? But actually, what he does... <laughs> Sorry, you've got to go... go before we go any further, I was, I will come back to the clothes in a second. Carry on, carry on, carry on. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. No, sorry. but I, I like the way he goes back. He starts the story in 1975. It's really the story of, of, of the kind of the electronic pop revolution, isn't it? You know, so, and it's that perfect marriage of kind of theatrical performance and synthesized dance music, the arrival of video, and the rise, of course, of the color pop magazines like The Face and Smash Hits. But what he does, he goes back to 75, doesn't he, and starts with David Bowie and Roxy Music, and then there's. Um, all these highlights, all these key figures, Quentin Crisp and the Naked Civil Servant, yeah, yeah, yeah. really good with his painted nails, his red hair, Giorgio Morona's Teutonic uh, Disco, Craftwork, Electronica, um, I Feel Loved by Donna Summer. I mean, all these these things feed into this movement. It's be, it's really, really well received. And, and nobody's better qualified than Dylan to do this kind yeah. of thing, really, because he's got that kind of broad, that broad view, you know, he's really comfortable with fitting it into where it fitted in alongside obviously fashion and clubbing and yeah. politics and riots and changes of government, all those kind of things. It's all there. It's an oral history, you know, so it's mainly, you know, Gary Kemp says this about so-and-so and then Toya says this about so-and-so, but it obviously links with a certain amount of Dylan, Dylan's commentary. Uh, which is uh, which he's well qualified to provide in this case because obviously he was there and uh, I, I was looking last night at when he when he wrote uh, wrote about the um, about the about the riots and about uh, about what it was like because he, li he was living in Brixton I think at the time yeah he was yeah and uh, and, and he, he says you couldn't quite believe things would ever return to normal what with the broken glass the boarded up windows. The dozens of overturned cars. You imagine that dozens of overturned cars. The smoke billowing from the shops in the market. The carpet shop always seemed to suffer. Not that any of the stock was ever taken. <laughs> what have the writers got against carpet shops? <laughs> the looters concentrated on the electrical shops, on the ghetto blasted television sets and radio radios. Cold Harbor Lane always looked like a fairly unforgiving place at the best of times. But for weeks after the riots, it felt as though it had been transported, directed from some post-apocalyptic wasteland, a tunnel of terror. And and uh, furthermore, he says, walking down the lane at night, you felt a little like Orpheus walking out of the underworld, too anxious to turn around and see what might be behind you. And that's that's one of the things that he does write about in this book, which I think people often forget is just... But things like going to gigs and so forth was a very violent thing. Wasn't well, it? it really was. And if you went, um, you know, dressed as Steve Strange with a with a peacock feather and a kind of uh, a velvet uh, bl blouson, you were kind of, uh, you know, highlighting the fact that you were you were different. Weren't but you? All, and also, it's and not exposed. Just, it's not just when you went to that kind of those kind of extremes. He's also got Alison Moye here. It was, yeah. uh, I think it was growing up in Basildon. I think she came from Basildon. And she talks about how, as a teenager, uh, your footwear could get you into a fight. If you turned the corner and you you ended up face-to-face -face with some Teds or some punks or whatever, who basically had different shoes from the ones <laughs> you wore. <laughs> you know, that was considered... That was considered, you know, uh, an invitation to step outside, which is pretty extraordinary. It is extraordinary. You know, we talk about all the venom people now, um, you know, spread on uh, social media. They, some of them used to do it actually in the in real person. world. 
in person, possibly yeah. accompanied by weapons from time to time. Sorry, I, I wanted to, I nearly held you up right at the beginning. Well, on the shoes front, there's a moment where uh, where Steve Strange, Steve Strange won't let Mick Jagger into whichever club it is, the Blitz, I think, supposedly because he's wearing trainers. Do you remember that? Yeah. I mean, obviously, that's just a brilliant piece of, uh, of PR. Um, publicity PR by Steve Strange to make a big thing of not letting him in, but letting David Bowie in. But it was the trainers that was meant to have clinched him. Yeah, yeah. So, so yes, shoe wars. The, 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 the clothes generally, you know, like you were saying, it was uh, jodhpurs and what did you say at the beginning? I said pixie jodhpurs. boots. Pixie boots, jodhpurs. We, the big joke at Smash Hits, and of course this is, you know, the cla- kind of classic era of Smash Hits, so there's quite a bit of Smash Hits in, in, in this there is. book. There uh, is. Was we always used to talk about tea towels, didn't we? As big... <laughs> A new romantic tea towel, sort of, sort of <laughs> casually, sort of th- a throw thrown across the shoulders. It's the idea. It's the idea that you felt, you know, every group felt that they ought to look a bit foppish, didn't they? Yeah. But very often they couldn't afford to go and buy anything, and so you improvised it from whatever your mother happened to have. Of course, what did your mother always have? Tea towels. Tea towel. <laughs> so. So any caption, all captions in Smash Hits during the early 80s usually had a reference to, to the tea towels that people were wearing, uh, wearing over their shoulders. And of course, it goes... It, it was always tea towel models own, wasn't it? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yes. I remember, I remember, Bust, oh, actually, Buster Blood Vessel once had a poster at the back of Smash Hits. Buster Blood Vessel wearing a vest. Do you remember that? Yeah. And the caption said, vest models own. Um, <laughs> it goes... Another thing struck me. He goes right up to um, to Live Aid, of course, and uh, and and then it's it's really interesting. I've got Bono here talking about how Freddie Mercury took him aside at, at Live Aid and told him how how much he liked him, you know, and that that he felt that every other other singers were shouting, but you're a singer, you know. He says, I was up against a wall, and he put his hand on the wall and was talking to me like he was chatting up a chick. A chick. <laughs> <laughs> he had me laughing, but I was shifting nervously at the same time, with Ali and myself exchanging glances. I thought, wow, this guy's really camp. I was telling somebody later, and he said, you're surprised. They call Queen. But I was really amazed. It hadn't dawned on me. It hadn't dawned on me. It was 1985. It hadn't dawned on me. But you see, I think that's that's a very candid it is. M- memory, you know, because gay was not invented, really, was it? No, you know, no. We're just really projecting back from a point that we, we <laughs> occupy now. Yeah. And actually, it was uh, absolutely. I mean, I can remember the, the thrill among Smash Hits readers when we printed pictures of, uh, you know, Martin Gore of Depeche Mode in a rubber dress. Do you remember that? <laughs> yes. Well, those things were just mystifying, weren't they? <laughs> well, also, people didn't self-identify to the extent that they do now. So nobody ever started a, an interview in those days saying, as a yeah. you know, so-and-so, I yeah. can only say so-and-so, which people do nowadays. As a so-and-so, and there's a way I look at it. Nobody did that in the early 80s. They Not were just... All kinds of people, and some of them happen to wear rubber dresses. <laughs> some of them, some of them happen to be gay without coming out about it. And then, it, and then you started to get people coming out about it. I suppose I can't remember at that point was Elton John gay or not. At that point, I, I, I lose think track. He was, but it's difficult to say because you can get married. Didn't he get married in the early eighties? He, I, think he, I think, think he did. I think he did about 1981, I think. So, <laughs> so you know, it's that a complicated thing. It's, yeah. confu- it's a confusing time, you know, obviously that. But even Boy George made no kind of, uh, made, made, never made it clear, did he? No. He, sort of, he had these brilliant quotes about, you know, he said, I, I prefer a cup of tea to I'd sex. I'd rather have a cup I'd of rather tea. Cup of tea. It's a great, great English line, isn't it? Yeah, and if anybody, you know, made any, any, you know, inference that he would say, well, that's just in your mind kind yeah, of thing. You yeah. know, that, that's just your old fashioned way of looking at things, looking at things. So, so there it is. Sweet dreams, the story of the new romantics. But I think, uh, I think it's clear. It's a lot more than the story of the new romantics. It's the story of the, of the early eighties. It's the story of our time. There it is. <laughs>